Without plastic and rubber, many aspects of modern life would be impossible. Imagine driving a car with wooden wheels and metal seats. Not a pretty picture. But how often do we think about the technology that makes these plastic and rubber parts work as well as they do? The secret often is that these things we use every day contain a microscopic dispersion of another material. That dispersed material may itself be another type of rubber or plastic that forms a separate phase, a lot like oil droplets in water. Or it could be a solid material that doesn't melt or flow at all, like a powdered mineral. Although ubiquitous and conceptually simple, we're still discovering surprising things about dispersions in plastic and rubber. My first realization that unexpected complexity lurks within these dispersions arose when I began working on fluoropolymer process aids. In this application, an infinitesimally small amount of fluoropolymer, just a few hundred parts per million, is dispersed into plastic like polyethylene. But even so, that dispersion of fluoropolymer particles drastically alters the processability of the polyethylene. So here's a picture of an extruded polyethylene strand that lacks that dispersion of fluoropolymer. It's very rough and ugly. The ridges are places where the polymer actually ripped as it exited the dye. So molten polymers can behave like a, a fluid or a solid, partly depending on how quickly they're deformed. To economically produce plastic film, the polyethylene has to be pushed through a dye with a narrow slit at high speed. And this causes the polyethylene to transition from a fluid that can flow to a solid that can't. And as a result, the polymer surface rips. We call this phenomenon melt fracture. Well, fluoropolymer process aids solve this problem of melt fracture because the particles of fluoropolymer dispersed in the polyethylene stick to the inside of the dye. This causes the fluoropolymer layer to build up and that allows the polyethylene to slip against the dye surface, reducing the deformation rate and then eliminating the melt fracture as shown in this series of images. But fluoropolymer is very expensive, so film producers want to use as little as possible. The question I asked myself was, what aspects of the fluoropolymer dispersion will ensure that the dye becomes coated as completely and quickly as possible and using the minimum amount of fluoropolymer? Well, most of the time, dispersions perform best when the particles are very small. And for decades, this paradigm was applied to eliminating melt fracture using dispersions of fluoropolymer. The thinking was that the fluoropolymer would be attracted to the metal dye surface and that a smaller particle could move more easily towards that dye sur surface and coat the dye like rain falling on a sidewalk. But I didn't understand how the fluoropolymer particles could move crosswise in the viscous polyethylene. I mean, sure, there are attractions between atoms and uh, molecules called van der Waals forces, but these operate over extremely short length scales. And nearly all studies of particle motions in flowing flu fluids show that the particles move away from stationary surfaces. So I entertained the opposite idea. Let's assume that the particles move through the dye without moving crosswise in the polyethylene. The only reason they contact the dye surface is because of converging flow at the entrance of the dye. Essentially, the polymer has to squeeze into that narrow dye slit. If you work out the math in this scenario, the fluoropolymer accumulation rate should scale with the square of the particle size, the fluoropolymer particle size. So that's not just a slight deviation from the textbook explanation, it's in radical opposition. But was it correct? To make a long story short, yes. Using this understanding, I developed process aids that could deliver large fluoropolymer particles to the dye, even under very demanding conditions of high shear mixing and high viscosity polyethylene. These new process aids eliminate melt fracture faster and more reliably than the previous versions that were designed to be easily dispersed. And they use only about one third of the fluoropolymer content. Well, a few years later, I was involved in another project that unbeknownst to me would hinge yet again on a previously unknown and surprising property of dispersions. We were working on making a more heat resistant rubber compound so that automotive hoses and gaskets would last longer. Well, as a general rule, rubber compounds contain a dispersion of very small particle fillers. That's because without the reinforcing effects of these particles, the rubber would generally be too soft and weak for practical applications. And from the outset, I knew that in the absence of these fillers, the rubber compound could survive high temperatures for much longer than a compound with the dispersion of those fillers. In fact, the rubber industry has for decades been well aware that these filler dispersions in general have a negative effect on heat aging. And the problem becomes more severe as the particle size of that dispersion becomes smaller. So you remember when I said that dispersions of very small particles tend to give the best performance? Well, that holds true 
for making rubber compounds with the best physical properties, tensile strength, tear strength, abrasion resistance. So what this means is that rubber technologists face a dilemma. Should they use a high strength compound that's gonna degrade rapidly at high temperature or a weaker one that's gonna last longer? But even more important, what causes this trade-off? Well, the answer lies in how the filler dispersion affects a phenomenon known as diffusion-limited oxidation. So diffusion-limited oxidation just means that the oxygen is reacting with the polymer faster than it can diffuse through the polymer. And that results in a relatively sharp boundary between the dark color degraded rubber shown in this image and the lighter color uh, less degraded rubber. The typical fillers used in rubber compounds like carbon black and silica though are impermeable to oxygen. And that might seem like a good thing, but it's not. Because these particles impede the diffusion of oxygen, they actually focus degradation on a very thin surface layer of the rubber. And that rubber layer then degrades rapidly. And as it does, it shrinks and it pulls away from the filler particles. This causes cracks. The cracks expose fresh rubber underneath. And, and this process repeats. And a wave of oxidation rapidly advances through the rubber part. And, and the rubber part fails much faster than in the absence of those conventional fillers. So even though mankind has been formulating rubber dispersions for well over a century, this understanding of how dispersions negatively affects high temperature aging was introduced to the rubber industry just a few years ago. Well, to solve this problem, I created an oxygen permeable dispersion, strongly bonded to the surrounding rubber to prevent cracking, and even better, a dispersion that sacrificially consumes some oxygen so as to protect the rubber. Well, what's that dispersion made of? It's a common plastic, nylon. Nylon particles in certain types of rubber provide excellent physical properties while enabling the compound to survive about three times longer during high temperature aging than conventional rubber compounds. The images show the highly uniform nylon dispersions in rubber and the visibly thinner degradation front as compared to the conventional filler after heat aging. So next time you pull out a plastic trash bag or drive off in your car, pause for a, a minute or two and remember the amazing and counterintuitive properties of polymer dispersions in the things we use every day.